Motion Q Score, and we are live at South by Southwest for the Daily Motion Hideaway Lounge South by Southwest 2014 edition. And I am lucky enough to be sitting here with two gentlemen from the film Ping Pong Summer. This one right here, Michael Tully, writer, director. That one over there, Michael Montez, composer. And tremendous film, uh, played at Sundance, gangbusters, got distribution, got picked up. Now in Michael Tully's hometown, is playing here at South by Southwest. So, gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So, you guys met in Brooklyn, right? Where you, you used to live in Brooklyn, uh, and you still live in Brooklyn. So, talk about how you guys met and worked on your first film, Septien, together. I had uh, just, I'd wrapped, I think, Septien. We shot in Nashville, Tennessee, and I came back, and we, we had mutual friends. And someone just suggested you guys should meet up, um, Andrew Grant, a friend of ours, film writer. And he, I think it was more, I don't know if he was hooking us up to be like work buddies romance, but um, I thought it was just meet this guy, you guys will like each other. And we went and had a beer and um, I started talking to Michael about what I was going to do with the movie. Um, I had written a theme, which I usually don't do, so I thought it would be weird and offensive to a, a schooled composer to say like, I have this theme, can you make it cool, but don't mess up the theme um, and uh, he he kind of I, I don't know I, it sounded like he'd never worked that way before if you want to talk about that and how you know someone presents you with something that's kind of already there but then of course you take it to another dimension well yeah I don't think I've ever worked that way before but um, since in the middle of the movie the, the brother characters actually sing the theme it kind of made sense to, to take that and weave it into the rest of the score and uh, and it was a lovely theme. It was a nice theme. It Thank had a, you. Had a nice sort of sad, mournful dirge quality that <laughs> that fit the uh, that fit the the movie quite well. And um, and it was, it was also a nice challenge to uh, to take it in lots of different places to really uh, reharmonize it and move it around and build it up and slim it down. And so do Michael, everything from a full orchestration to solo piano with it. So for the score of this film, talk about what uh, the movie first of all takes place in 1985 in Ocean City, Maryland kind of a semi-autobiographical story, very, a semi. semi. And it stars Susan Sarandon and Judah Friedland and John Hanna and a tremendous bunch of newcomers. Um, and so talk about the path that you guys worked on for the music and what you were looking for and, and direction you gave Michael to start work. Um, yeah, it's funny because Michael, uh, I had, I basically gave you, I think, a playlist of like 85. The movie's set in 85, and it was important to be set in 85 because I think 86 is when the world changed hip hop wise, like License to Ill dropped and then Raising Hell. And that's when it really became mainstream hip hop. Um, so for me, and also you get into the clearance game. So it's like, if you're trying to make a movie with hip hop from 88, 89, that's like not going to happen. I think you'd probably vouch for that <laughs> as far as clearance. Um, so when you're talking 85, like even Houdini Friends, which is a really catchy beat and the melody and the hook but those guys were coming up with that stuff and Mantronics that's all original um, so I put a playlist together for Michael and I think you you can speak to this but I, th I think you were telling me that it's like you were using all of these drum machines in the 80s but for totally different reasons like not for hip-hop and commercials or something but um but I could do something like say LL Cool J I can't live without my radio and I put that on and I'm like why is that snare so fat why does that sound so great and right away he's like oh that's two that's two kick drums um, it's not just one drum machine that's why when you bought the one drum machine you thought they were using they weren't they were layering other drum machines tricks like that that maybe you weren't as versed in hip-hop but you totally understood that right away that I in a, in a way that I couldn't um, but I think the gift of what Michael did in this movie is he did four things at once so there's the hip-hop element um, but there's also the for the Stacy character the love interest there's a uh, I guess you'd say the like kind of John Hughes dream pop um, and for the bad guys we kind of went maybe like a little Miami Vice like uh, guttural uh, synthy and then danger. the danger danger synthesizer and then um the last one was the kind of Amblin Entertainment, Steven Spielberg orchestral um, swell that just is sort of inherent to those movies from 1985. And this guy did all of it at once. Not at once, in, in sections, <laughs> but at the same time. And tell us about your process in composing on this film. Well, um, the sounds of the, from the genre do a lot of the work, right? I mean, the sounds of the kick drums, the snare drums, the synthesizers, all those kinds of things. And uh, it was fun to search through and develop a whole palette of those kind of things in order to execute the different uh, parts of the score. Um, 
one other nice thing that we did, which is, um, I mean, every film I work on, it turns out, is a very different process. But I started writing music before you were shooting. And um, we wanted to sort of establish a tone and really see where, where we could take the whole uh, hip hop thing to and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I was able to write some nice pieces based on the script. And the script was so beautifully written. It's the kind of script when you're reading it, you can just feel like you're inside the movie. So that was very inspiring, very, very helpful to get started on the music before even seeing any picture happening. And I think you used some of that, that music too um, when you were driving around, scouting and doing things like that. So it was a nice collaborative kind of organic process in, in that regard. And um, a lot of that music ended up being uh, reworked and worked into the score and it stuck. Yeah, it's a nice balance. The score really works well with the songs. We used a, a wide mixture of everything from the Fat Boys to open the movie to John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band in a very important uh, driving to Ocean City montage. So, Tully, talk about the, the differences for you in that the pop, the, you know, in the movie, the, the different genres represented are, the, you know, the early hip hop, as we talked about, the straight pop and the Mr. Mr., and then you also have the R&B of the Midnight Stars and the new editions. Talk about your palette for music in this movie and what you looked for. It's tough because, uh, you know, I, I love movies that are overloads of music or like a dazing and fuse where every scene is kind of thrusted as soon as you're, you're, it's driving, as soon as the music starts and the scene starts, you're into a song. Um, I wanted it to play as organic and almost subtle as possible, not be like wink, wink, um, uh, Night Rangers on in the mall. You know, I wanted it to sort of be there and we like cleared till Tuesday's voices carry and that was a, a sense that you could have probably banged out something for that scene to be in the background. Um, but I, I felt like it's, you know, when you're making a low budget movie, people don't, there are so many reasons for people not to take you seriously and not to treat it like a real movie. So I feel like we set these parameters and to their credit, the producers supported that theory. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just this organic, I think when you're trying to make a movie, it's so intellectual and the technical process that the more I can get that out of the way, and this was, like we said, it's, it's very personal, it's maybe not autobiographical, but uh, many elements are very personal. So that thought of like, I did go to that mall and buy that Mantronics cassette on, and it was like Midnight Madness, so it was a dollar off. So instead of eight ninety nine, it was seven ninety nine, and I went home. You remember, you remember that, huh? I do remember that, you yeah. You smelled the cassette when it was open? I kind of <laughs> did you know we were gonna at a panel at Sundance it was a sort of show and tell and I was gonna I used to be able to know the label I could be like this is cold chillin records wow. this is profile like they each had their own Whoa. scent and then I actually went to uh, the, the week before Sundance gearing up I was pulling through my tape collection because I still have all those cassettes and they just like lost their smell they lost wow. their scent. It's very sad. And tell us about other stuff. You have another film here, Michael, right? Tell us about that. It's called Wild Canaries, and it screened last night. We had a really great, great screening, and um, the music for that is uh, is very different. It's uh, dub reggae meets uh, '70s uh, cop movie wow. music. So it's sort of uh, goofy but suspenseful. That's cool. And Tully, what did, what are you you're writing a script now? You would tell us about that one. Uh, as much as you can. Maybe a creepy movie in Ireland. Um, that was the pitch. Uh, I think finally now we have a script that's said we're heading back into Septian direction. We had this sort of pleasant um, 80s movie charming thing <laughs> and now it's like let's get sort of dark again. Still have a sense of humor. But yeah, it's trying to be inspired by I think all the movies I make is like combining my own personal uh, instincts with uh, genre, you know, because I watch a lot of movies and this one was what, what if you put my life into an 80s movie. Septian was like what if you put uh, a southern gothic and then an art film like Spirit of the Beehive in a blender and this one is like what if we did a riff and a sort of tribute to those 70s psychodramas like right. Don't Look Now or The Wicker Man um, and just put our little spin on it. And also talk about your uh, Hammer and Nail. Tell us about that. Hammer and Nail is a website that was founded in 2008 by uh, Corbin Day and Ted Hope and I and I guess myself they recruited me very early and Mike Ryan a producer and what we try to be is like there's just so much content in the world and like in New York 29 movies are opening every weekend and it's really hard to decide what to watch or you go to your Apple TV and you're just like I don't know what to watch so rather than covering everything we just try to sort of 
curate and a filter and say these the movies that we're writing about on the site maybe we love them maybe we like them maybe we just think they're interesting but uh we want people to watch movies and love movies as much as we do so it's a positive uh, curatorial voice hammer to nail great so check out the, uh tell us when when ping pong summer's coming out and how it's getting out there june 6 theatrical video on demand uh we don't know the exact theatrical yet but we'll be in major markets like 10 to 20 i think is our hope and then very exclusively in Maryland, I want to focus and make that feel like a real release because the movie is, uh, hopefully it'll work if you've never been to Maryland. We just screened in Rotterdam and a bunch of Dutch people laughed at it. So I didn't know if it was like <laughs> a Maryland's foreign language. Globe, yeah, right? apparently Maryland accents work everywhere. Right. Um, and uh, June 6th, yeah, so very soon. Well, it's a great film, Ping Pong Summer, soundtrack released in end of May on J2 In Groove's Records. So uh, pick that up. It's a tremendous compilation. Also, the last track on the record. Tell us about Young Champion Hamper, Hammer Throw as we close. Hammer Throw is uh, 1997. I lived in Athens, Georgia, and I got a phone call at my friend's house, and he said, is Ben home? And I said, no, Ben's not home. He's on tour. And he said, well, we're looking for a fourth person to play tennis. And I said, I play tennis. I just moved here. Who are you? Can I play with you? And then uh, I joined this foursome, and uh, that was Kevin Barnes from of Montreal, who's a good tennis player. And uh, we were talking about ping pong summer, and this is 1997, and now I'm talking to you in 2014, so that's wow. either Trip awesome or depressing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the, throughout these years, Kevin has just, you know, of Montreal has really grown and grown, and he's stuck to his muse and done really different things. So when the time came to actually make the movie, he's encyclopedic about all kinds of music, so he knows like all the lyrics, all the songs to these 80s anthems, and he drills it. So the, he created the only real original pop song for the movie is the closing credits, um, and then he goes by the alter ego hammer throw. Yes. But Kevin of Montreal, thank you for a tremendous end title song. And thank you once again, Q Score, uh, Austin, Texas, 2014, South by Southwest, Daily Motion. Thank you guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. For more Q Score, please check us out at empowerme.tv to find out what goes on behind the curtain and how the film and TV music gets made. It happens right here. Tune in. <laughs>